Thank you to MOVA for sponsoring today's video. Hello and welcome to Moncton, New Brunswick. Today we're climbing aboard the ocean. The Eastern Sleeper Train will take us from here down to Montreal while riding on board one of VIA's European-style Renaissance sleeper cars. Located on the southwest side of town, Moncton Station is a small intercity passenger rail facility serving via rails the Ocean Sleeper between Montreal and Halifax and Maritime Buses intercity bus lines. The station consists of a small waiting area, a few via rail ticketing desks, a baggage claim, and information stalls for Maritime Bus. Moncton was not my original choice for the starting point of this journey. My eastbound ticket on the ocean was booked through to Halifax, but it turns out that at the same time, Nova Scotia was receiving some of the heaviest rainfall the province had seen in decades. In 24 hours, it rained over 10 inches in some places, washing away roads and flooding houses. Just south of Truro, the only train line connecting Halifax to the rest of Canada was washed away. The immense amount of rain and debris caused the earth beneath the railway to give out, leaving the tracks dangling over a river. With no path to Halifax, the crew announced that our train would be terminating in Moncton, with buses driving passengers the rest of the way. I wasn't interested in the three-hour drive from Moncton to Halifax, and thus decided to book a hotel here in Moncton. Waiting out on Moncton's only track is our train, via rail number 15, the Ocean. The Ocean operates a fleet of Via Rail's Renaissance sleeper cars. The Renaissance coaches are a fleet of cars built by Metro Camel in the 1990s for the proposed Night Star service. The Night Star was to be an overnight train between the UK and continental Europe, operating via the Channel Tunnel. The coaches were based on the British Mark IV coach and built to fit the British loading gauge, with car body construction strong enough to meet European standards. As a result of their British and European design, their internal layout is much the same as a traditional European sleeper, as we'll see once on board. We'll be staying in Car 37, Room 9, on today's adventure. It's just our luck that Car 37 is easily visible from the side of the station, so we know where to go well before boarding begins. In addition to the Renaissance cars, the Ocean occasionally operates a couple of Bud stainless steel coaches. The Chateau sleepers seen here were manufactured in the 1950s and have seen service with both Canadian Pacific and Via Rail. We actually rode on one of these 1950 sleepers in our ride out to Moncton, and if you missed that video, I recommend checking it out. Links will be in the top right or in the description below. While we wait for boarding to begin, let's take a look at our route down to Montreal. Our adventure begins heading northwest out of Moncton, our train crossing through Miramichi and Bathurst as night falls. We cross into Quebec as the clock hits midnight, about an hour behind schedule, the ocean reaching its northernmost point of Montjoly around 3 a.m. The tracks then hug the St. Lawrence River south, the waterway our guide to our stop in Sainte Foy just after sunrise and two hours late. We then meander through the Canadian farmland until our second and final crossing of the St. Lawrence River, the ocean pulling into Montreal's Gare Centrale at the end of the line. We'll cover a total of 653 miles on our ride today, with a travel time of 19 hours and 36 minutes. While a 2D map of our route is cool, what's even cooler is a full globe, which is why I'm pleased to introduce today's sponsor, MOVA. MOVA globes are globes powered by light. Using first-of-its-kind low-light solar cells, MOVA globes turn automatically when exposed to ambient light. Their ultra-low friction motor design is at least an order of magnitude lower friction than current consumer motors, which allows MOVA globes to rotate in complete silence with extremely low power draw. Magnets hidden within the globe power the rotation without the need for messy cords or batteries. This means you can pick them up and admire their beauty in the palm of your hand. Choose from over 40 designs, including maps, outer space, famous artworks, and more. There's always a globe for everyone. MOVA's stunning outer space collection features graphics provided by NASA and JPL, which includes planets, moons, asteroids, and constellations. Get yours today at movaglobes.com and use code LTR10 for 10% off any 6-inch and 8.5-inch globes. Thank you to MOVA for sponsoring today's video. The unforeseen circumstances of today's departure mean that boarding for train 15 begins at 5.41 p.m., nine minutes after our train scheduled departure. With only one door and almost six stations worth of people, it's quite the crunch to get out to the platform. Fortunately, we scouted our car out ahead of time, so all we have to do is head up the train once through the doors. 
Making our way past the diner, service car, and first sleeper, we reach the open door for car 37 and can climb aboard. Just down the hall from the entrance, we find room 9, our home for the next 19 and a half hours. Boarding wraps up relatively quickly, and our train begins to roll out of the station at 6.04 p.m., 30 minutes behind schedule. A few minutes after departing Moncton, our wonderful car attendant comes through to introduce herself and to give us a rundown of the car. A Canadian safety requirement for all trains is to have a passenger briefed on the operation of the exit in the event of an emergency. It just so happens that our car attendant requested me to be the one briefed on the emergency exit, so let's do that briefing together. And yes, I did ask for permission to film this. Returning to our room, it's time to take a tour of Via's European sleepers. Each Renaissance sleeper is configured with 10 two-person cabins and a single long hallway along one side of the train. The single aisle, double occupancy room layout is more akin to sleeper trains found in Europe, which makes sense given these cars' European history. Our room number 9 is the penultimate room of each car. Access to each room is granted through a hotel-style keycard, the door locking automatically once closed. Every room comes with two key cards, the two found on the center table upon entry. First impressions are everything, and I have to say our cabin looks smart and cozy. The interior layout is again akin to that of their European counterparts. For example, here's one of Nightjet's deluxe sleeper cabins in both its day and night configurations. In their daytime configuration, Renaissance bedrooms include a couch with room for two people. Annoyingly, there's no way to change the seating direction, which means we'll be facing backwards for the entire journey. The couch includes two wide armchairs with folding armrests, a pillow, and a headrest integrated into the wall above. The seats are a little on the thin side, having been worn down over many years of use. Though virtually identical, the window seat includes a small mesh pocket for personal belongings. Between the two seats upon entry, passengers will find the two room keys, two bottles of water, a couple napkins, and French and English guides to the ocean. The guide includes landmarks and notable scenery throughout our journey, with a map at the top to show each place's approximate location. The central table can be folded away into the couch. Beneath the couch is storage space for at least three suitcases. The couch bottom can also be raised slightly to help fit oversized items. Just inside the door are the master light controls, the switches controlling the various overhead lights. Above the lights is an emergency attendant call button. Below is the temperature control dial, which works super well, especially for a train. The dial notches into place with each adjustment, and the temperature change is felt within minutes, which is great. On the wall opposite the couch is the room's center console and storage space. The wood veneered cabinet provides a welcome warm color contrast to the whites and blues of the Renaissance fleet. Inside the right cabinet are two or three cup holders and what I think is a napkin dispenser, I'm not entirely sure. 
Behind the complimentary box of tissues are the room's two main outlets, below which is the trash can. The left cabinet is entirely open for storage, though there's a cable routing hole in the shelf, so I can only assume that some sort of entertainment device was housed here at some point. The tall central cabinet opens to reveal a deep but narrow coat rack. Alternatively, permanent clothes hangers are found on the wall to the side of the center console. Two curtains extend to cover the window on the far wall of the cabin. They don't really do much besides provide privacy when closed. They're thin mesh letting in tons of light during the day. Beneath the window is the room's only table. It's quite small and doesn't extend far enough out to cover my legs, let alone provide enough space to work or dine. One of the biggest amenities offered with Renaissance bedrooms is their ensuite bathroom. Pushing open the door, we enter the small personal facility. Each bathroom comes equipped with a sink, vanity, and toilet. Because the door opens inward, it's a little cumbersome getting inside, but there's enough space once the door is closed. The sink works well with both hot and cold taps, two bars of soap, and plenty of hand and face towels. Inside the lower mirror compartment are the second pair of outlets, with more toilet paper and a bar of soap found in the upper storage area. Though a small facility, it works great for a personal bathroom. The only thing missing from our bathroom, though, is a shower. Via's Renaissance cabins come in two types, those with and without showers. The latter sold out by the time I booked our ticket. From what I can tell, though, we aren't missing out on much. The shower is integrated into the main bathroom much like those on Amtrak's bedrooms, so I'm okay without it for one night. When day turns to night, each Renaissance cabin converts into two bunks. Pulling up on the latch besides the couch unlocks the lower bunk, which folds down across the seats. A similar action is required to release the upper bunk, the top bed rotating out from the wall. And here's what the room looks like with both bunks in place. Each bunk includes upper and lower sheets, and a thick comforter for those cold Canadian winters. That top bunk is awfully high up, and some of you may be wondering how to get up there. Well, I'll show you. Hidden away beneath the upper bunk is a ladder. Undoing the rubber latch reveals the ladder, which hooks onto the top bunk. Ascending the ladder, we can swing up into the top bed. Both beds are 72.5 inches long and 27.5 inches wide, or 184 centimeters by 70 centimeters. While these would be plenty long for most passengers, they leave my feet hanging well off the end of the bed. The top bunk is also quite close to the ceiling, so be careful when sitting up. Up top, we find a small folding table for a drink, maybe? I wouldn't trust myself not to knock it over while asleep, and the AC vent. A small reading light is found near the head of each bed, with one for the upper and lower bunks. Speaking of, the lower bunk is much the same as the upper. It's still 72.5 inches long, 2.5 too short for me, and 27.5 inches wide. The same folding table is found beside the bed, with a small pocket for personal belongings. We won't need the beds for another couple of hours, and can fold them back away. After enjoying the ride for a bit, our dinner reservation is called over the PA system. The dining car on the ocean is located towards the center of the train. The dining car is almost exclusively for tables, with a small service space in the middle for the waitstaff. Food prep has been moved to the ends of the service cars on either end, with a small kitchen for each half of the coach. Each car includes a total of seven tables of four and seven of two, allowing for a maximum capacity of 42 passengers. The tables are set for dinner when we arrive, the car attendant seating us at a table of two, the seat across from us filled by another solo passenger. Dinner on the ocean is a three-course meal. Dining starts with a super salad appetizer, followed by a main course and a dessert. 
for dinner today are beef bourguignon, pork chasse, filet of sole, and a penne pasta. From the selection, I chose the maple roasted squash salad to start and the pork chasse as a main. What's wonderful about Via's dining options is that each menu changes every day. For example, this trip was filmed the day after our ride up to Moncton and the dining selection is entirely different. I absolutely love this about Via sleeper trains, as it means repeat passengers can try something new each time they're on board. The salad is first up, the plate of mixed greens topped with maple roasted squash, walnuts, and radishes. It's a small but tasty appetizer, the light dressing pairing well with the rich sweet flavor of the squash. While waiting for our main course, the ocean crosses the southwest Miramichi River and Oxford Brook, the two bridges totaling half a mile in length. Our main course is soon served. It may look fine as far as appetizing goes, but it tastes great and that's all that matters. The pork chasse is juicy, savory, and tender, paired with the wonderful sweetness and tang of the hoisin sauce. The fried rice is fine, the scallion cutting through the otherwise salty side. The chili green beans add a nice fresh note to the meal, though I would have liked a little more kick from the chili. Separately, the sides would have been okay at best, but together with the pork, they create a delicious and filling meal. As delicious as our main course was, it's worth noting that the meals on Via are catered, not freshly cooked. Everything is cooked before departure, where it's then reheated and plated for dining. The food is delicious regardless of how it was made, but it's definitely worth noting. Dessert this evening is a little slice of lemon cake with cream cheese frosting. Dinner as a whole comes in at a 7.5 out of 10. It's a little below our previous dinner experience on the ocean, but definitely not bad. By the time we finish dining, the sun has reached its final descent towards the horizon. The glowing orange ball peeks through the trees as we slowly work our way through the Canadian wilderness, the sky alight with hues of pinks, blues, and oranges. Daylight fades as the sun slips below the tree line, our crossing of the Nipisiguit River, the last thing we'll see as night sets in on day one. And with that, we can climb under the covers for a good night's rest. The morning of day two begins with sunlight streaming in through the window. It's about 7.30 a.m. Eastern Time, our train having crossed time zones overnight. Pulling back the curtains reveals the lush green Canadian countryside. Heading back to the dining car, we can get seated for breakfast. Breakfast on the ocean is offered on the first come first serve basis. The options for breakfast today include a smoked meat omelette, lemon ricotta pancakes, or a continental selection. Breakfast, as always, starts with a freshly brewed cup of coffee and a glass of orange juice, the two of which quickly followed by a plate of pre-buttered toast. As we wait for our food, the ocean passes Canadian National's Joffre Yard before breaking away onto the very sharp curve towards Charny and eventually Sainte-Foy. As we begin our crossing of the St. Lawrence River via Canadian National's Quebec Bridge, breakfast is served. For breakfast, I decided on the lemon ricotta pancakes, topped with a blueberry compote and served with a side of pork sausages. The pancakes are wonderful. They're not too sweet, the flavor cut nicely by the sour lemon, and the tart blueberry compote ties everything together. The pork sausage is a little on the tough side, but it's salty and savory, the flavor contrast a welcome addition. And unlike on Amtrak, we get actual Canadian maple syrup instead of the usual corn syrup, a nice bonus on top of what is already a great breakfast. I'd have to say this is a solid 7.5 out of 10. It's definitely tasty, but not nearly as good as our crepes from the journey east. 
While we dined, we crossed the Canadian National Quebec Bridge. The 3,238-foot or 987-meter-long structure supports three highway lanes, one rail line, and a pedestrian walkway. The ocean then makes a sharp left turn before arriving in Sainte Foy. By this point, our train is almost two hours late. Reduced speeds on the lines north and freight traffic has meant our hour delay has now doubled. Sainte Foy is the only fresh air break on today's train, and it's just our luck that we're seated at breakfast right as it happens. Not wanting to abandon our breakfast, I opted to forego our fresh air opportunity. 13 minutes after arriving in Sainte Foy, the ocean begins to move again, but this time we're moving backwards. When pulling into Sainte Foy, the ocean arrives engines first, but in order to get back on track, it must retrace its steps all the way back to the spur at Canadian National's Joffre Yard. Back in our room, the couch is finally facing the direction of travel, at least for these few minutes. If you're enjoying our adventure on the ocean, why not hit that subscribe button? It's totally free and it really helps support the channel. I also want to give a huge shout out and thank you to my patrons and channel members. Y'all are amazing and I cannot thank you enough for your incredible support. If you too want your name in the video or just want to support the channel in more ways than one, then head on over to the links in the description below. With a bit of time before our arrival in Montreal, let's take a quick tour of our train. The first car on the ocean is a baggage transition coach. Renaissance coaches include a European-style coupling system, which is not compatible with North American rolling stock. The transition cars, as the name implies, transition the coupling from European to North American, allowing the Renaissance cars to operate with Vias locomotives at the front and Bud cars at the rear. The second car on today's train is the first of three coach cars. For passengers still wanting to travel on the overnight train without paying the hefty charge for a room, coach class is a great way to travel. Coach class is operated in a 2 by one All of the seats in the Renaissance coaches are elevated above the floor, separating passengers from the aisle and providing a sense of privacy when seated. This elevation allows bags to be stored beneath one seat, allowing for increased security when asleep. Above both sides of the train are mid-range storage bins, accessible only from the side of each designated row. Each coach seat offers around 9 inches of legroom, with a small footrest on the bottom of each seat back. The small seat back pocket is located on the lower half of the seat, the large tray table stowed away in its holster. The table slides up and out before folding out across the seat. Other at-seat amenities include two power outlets and a trash bag on the wall, an LED reading light, and the same thin curtains as in our cabin. For when it's time to relax or get some shut-eye, each seat can recline quite far. Pulling up on the latch integrated into the armrest allows the bottom to slide forward and the back to recline, though I find that my feet end up crammed under the seat in front, which is less than ideal. While these seats may be comfortable for a couple hours, I definitely wouldn't want to stay here overnight. I can already see the cushioning giving out after hour 6, only to leave you with 18 more to go. That being said, it is significantly cheaper than a sleeper ticket, so if you're willing to put up with some mild discomfort, then coach is a great option. The next three car on the ocean are sleepers, followed by a service car. The service car serves as a cafe and lounge area for all passengers on the ocean. As mentioned earlier, the service car also houses the kitchen for the dining car. The service cars are the only cars on the ocean with Wi-Fi, and with limited cell service throughout the journey, it's often the only way to stay online while in transit. 
The next car is the diner, followed by another service car, a single Renaissance coach car, and then yet another transition car. This transition car is entirely empty, serving only to transition from European to North American couplers. Via has turned the car into a bit of a museum, with the flags of Canada and her provinces on the walls. There's also an old map of Via's route, which show quite a few lines that haven't run in a long time. It also shows two American destinations that haven't been served in many years, Chicago and Detroit. Amtrak's 2035 plan shows service restored between Chicago and Toronto, with one round trip of the Wolverine extended into Canada. Behind the second transition coach is a single bud coach car and three bud chateau sleepers, the third of which is the crew car. If you're interested in seeing what travel is like in one of those chateau sleepers, then check out our previous ride up to Moncton at the link in the top right or in the description below. Returning to our room, the scenery outside has slowly begun its transition from rural to suburban, the ocean snaking away behind us. Exo stations fly past the window, the Montreal Metropolitan Airport marking the beginning of the end of our adventure. Much as we crossed it to get to saint foy we must once again cross the St. Lawrence River before arriving in Montreal. Through the trees of Ile Notre Dame, we can briefly spot the Turn 3 bleachers and pit straight of the Circuit de Gilles Villeneuve. The track is home to the Formula One Canadian Grand Prix and is actually open to the public when not in use as a racetrack. The skyline of Montreal grows ever taller as we cross the Victoria Bridge. As we reach solid ground on the other side, the tracks of Montreal's REM fly overhead. The REM, or Réseau Express Metropolitan, currently serves five stations between Montreal Central and the suburb of Brossard. Plans are in place to construct a total of 26 stations, three branch lines, and cover an impressive 42 miles of track. Behind us, our train makes the final turn north towards Montreal's Gare Centrale. We traverse the viaduct through downtown, our train pulling to a stop in Montreal, 19 hours and 36 minutes after the journey began. Grabbing our belongings, we can head down the corridor and out onto the platform, where we'll bring today's video to a close. Thank you. Have a good one. Next week, we'll be back in New York City for a quick Northeast Regional ride from New York Penn Station to New Haven, Connecticut. If you're new around here, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button down below. It's totally free, and it really helps support the channel. Another huge thank you to my loyal patrons and members. Y'all are amazing, and your incredible generosity is greatly appreciated. If you too want your name in the video, or just want to support the channel in more ways than one, then head on over to the links in the description below. But anyways, that's all I have for today. Thanks for riding with me, and I'll see you in the next one.